session, and we will focus on the topic of grief and loss. Specifically during this COVID pandemic, um, and we are going to be presenting information and resources and materials for adults, teens, and children. So the Well Foundation, if you're not familiar with it, um, is a nonprofit organization that focuses on community building in the areas of social economics, um, education, and also mental health or in medical. So we have three presenters for today. Our first presenter is Ms. Stephanie Waterpurse, and she has spent 35 years as a social worker providing services to children and families in Baltimore City. She has been an active member of her church since the age of seven. She believes strongly in community service. She was also a campfire girl, a Girl Scout, and now in retirement is an active member of her community, Neighborhood Community Association. One of her quotes is, each one reach one means a lot to me, especially when one of the youth in my neighborhood reaches out to me to get assistance and support to make positive changes in their the life. age of seven. So thank you for joining us, Ms. Whitehurst. Our second thank panelist you. would be Dr. Paul Dyer. Dr. Dyer has devoted over 40 years to the exploration of the whole living sciences. From the studies of traditional and alternative methods in martial arts and natural sciences, Dr. Paul set out to educate and connect humanity to our emotional self and how it affects our bodies. He is an advocate and constant student of quantum science of consciousness and natural healing. Dr. Dr. Paul Dyer, holds three doctorates and three master's degrees. So thank you, Dr. Dyer, for joining us tonight. It's great to be here. <laughs> and our last presenter will be Miss Erica Bridgeford. Miss Bridgeford trains mediators, teaches conflict resolution skills, co-organizes a movement that rallies Baltimore City to avoid violence during three-day weekends, and perform, performs rituals for every person who was murdered in Baltimore. Her life has been impacted by murder since she was 12 years old, and she has been working for over 20 years to ensure that murder does not have the last say. From addressing rape culture to advocating for death penalty repeal, Ms. Bridgeford's, Bridgeford's ability to influence social injustice is fueled by her commitment to transform her personal pain into hope and action. She is the Director of Training at Community Mediation Maryland. She's the co-founder and co-organizer of Baltimore Ceasefire 365 and an inspirational speaker. Her awards and recognitions include the Outstanding Volunteer Contribution to Victim Services by the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention, which was awarded to her in 2015, the Best Baltimorean by the City Paper in 2017, Peacemaker of the Year by Baltimore's Community Mediation Center in 2017, and Marylander of the Year by the Baltimore Sun in 2017. So thank you to all three of our panelists and our co-panelists for joining us today. So, Ms. Stephanie, would you like to start us off? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm a bit challenged, so, so you all please let me know if uh, if I fall off, okay? Because right now I'm seeing you more so than seeing myself. But anyway, good evening, everyone. I want to be succinct um, in these 15 minutes that I have, and I'm sure a lot of what we say is going to overlap. I just want to start. I don't want to assume that everyone is familiar, those that are listening, with the um, with what we're talking about tonight. They may be familiar on some level, but I think it is important, first of all, to let me just apologize to you all. If you're like me, you're sharing space with other people. It's turned into workspace. Play space is turned into workspace, and it looks like a junk space. So if anything you see in this room tonight causes you some grief, just call me, and I'll give you a free session. With that said, I think we just need to start by uh, defining what we're talking about, grief. And I wanted to look at three points, um, which was what is it? What does it look like? You can look, it's not always the same look. And the response, you know, uh, the response is going to be different for each need and for each expression. And I added on continuing care. When we look at grief, 
And these are some homemade charts that you can see. When we look at grief, when we're speaking of grief, uh, first of all, for those that are clinicians and work in the field, we look to our Bible, which is the DSM right now, the five, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and it'll give you a definition. But first, let me talk about Webster's. We'll just talk about that grief is the process of, of mourning, and it's a response that one has to loss. And you see, when you're talking about grief, people think about death. But we're going to talk about some other losses. The pioneer in the field of grief that most uh, folks are familiar with is Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was a Swedish psychiatrist who studied death and dying. She wrote this book that's another Bible in the field that was published in 1969 on death and dying. And what Dr. Kubler-Ross did is she actually talked with people who were dying to talk about how they were feeling, their experiences, their family members and loved ones that visited them. And she got a, a different perspective than what had been seen by uh, practitioners and doctors before. Uh, she also worked with ministers. And based on that, Dr. Ross came up with what she called, the first, I don't think you can say that, but five stages of grief. And I'm going to do a PowerPoint and put all of that on there. So these stages are what Dr. Kubler-Ross, and, and you can't see it, so I'll speak to it, came up with that people would experience and experience a loss. And they are denial, shock, anger, bargaining, and acceptance. Not everyone goes through all of those stages, and not, and it's not a linear process. So it's not that you start somewhere and you go through all of them. That's not what happens uh, in that process. One of the things that the DSM, that manual that I told you about, and I want to read something that I wrote here, that when it defines it, when it talks about grief, um, it's using different language now, and I'm referring to it as persistent bereavement. You know, when we talk about grief, as I said, historically, it's addressed, grief addressed like, you know, losing someone to death, but not so much only now. And I'm looking at my, um, there we are, my charts. You know, there are various types of losses. Of course, you look at death. I hope you all can see that. Health, financial losses, emotional losses, losses of relationships, loss of dreams, opportunities, feeling safe. And in the time of COVID, it has really expanded because there's a loss of, of our young people of school, adults of the workplaces, you know, there's someone that's lost a job, so they have financial loss, but there are other folks that have still had their job, but they've lost their workplace. So they were trying to work at home with spouse and partners and children and parents and a lot of noise and a lot of neighbors and a lot of outside noise. And so they've lost their workplace. There are some people that say, I thank God for work because that's how I get away. So our children have lost their play spaces, okay? What some people say, the only place I find some peace is at my church or my place, my masjid or my mosque or my temple. Well, house of worship, most of them are still closed. So losing the place to worship. Children have lost recreational spaces, not just the rec center, not somewhere where they can go and, um, you know, address their feelings and get their emotions out uh, uh, and, and expend some of that energy by playing ball. The rec centers are closed, but if you all remember, the basketball hoops were cut down as well. So because of social distancing, they couldn't even go to the, uh, what do you call it, the playground or what have you. So much. Everyone experiences some type of loss. Even, I don't know if you can see this, but even babies experience loss. And as a result, they feel grief as well. Uh, I had broken it down to children 0 to 6, 7 to 12, teenagers, transitional ages, adulthood, maturehood, and the agent. When I'm referring to the agent, because you all know that my road dog, uh, I reside now with my dad, who's 94. Seniors losing, well, like my dad said, he was loose, used to losing people. He was married twice. His first wife died when they were very young and early in their marriage. He was married to my mom 50-plus years. She died. He lost all of his brothers, most of his siblings. Out of 13, there are just four left, friends. So they're used to, many seniors are used to death. 
But now they've lost connection. No more eating together. No more meals. Well, yes, there's meals on wheels, but no more some of the social programs and the get-togethers and the senior center meetings. So a lot. I saw um, a quote someone wrote that the entire world is grieving together. You know, that process. And grief is just that. Feeling bereaved as a result of a loss. And then there's so many losses. The losses are compounded. Many, many. Before complicated grief is some is a term that was used because before you could deal with one loss and mm-hmm. fully grieve that, and you don't get over losses. You work through them. You may have to go back. Something may trigger you, and you go back and experience them again. But now we're finding in the time of COVID, before you can address and kind of work through and achieve some type of normalcy, because that's a word that's almost non-existent now something else happens before you can uh, uh, mourn one death someone else is dying before you can get through that death someone else is in the hospital it may not be COVID but you can't go see them so you lose the presence presence is very important and all of that and I don't know where I did with that my other chart but all of that comes down to the word that we hear a lot trauma our, everyone is traumatized. Uh, those that know me know I, I do a lot since I've been retired, even before with the young people in my neighborhood. I call them my street corner prophets. I said, I've claimed you for the kingdom. I claim you because you're mine. I'm going to love you. When we talk, you know, they do their thing, you know, but we've connected as family. And that trauma, that big word that a lot of people throw around, well, that little word that people throw around, but it has a large impact. Um, for the young person that found school a safe place because there's abuse and neglect or home wasn't safe, they no longer have that. So they're hyper vigilant now. And there's that, a hyper arousal that they're always on guard, you know, and they're grieving the loss of their safe place. Um, as I said before about the seniors. So, in terms of grief, and somebody please make sure I, I didn't look at the time that I'm still on my time. That's what we're seeing. Um, trauma because of what's happening in my, our beloved Baltimore City. I have some notes here. It's Whitehurst. I think you're frozen. No. Okay. Okay, she's back. Some. Am I back? Okay. Am I yes. back? Okay. Yes, so, so think about that. Uh, I work with folks that you know. I'm a, I'm a news junkie. We get the newspapers. I read various newspapers. Print. As you can see, all around my bedroom, I have the Sun Taper, uh, the Afro, the Washington times you know this paper that paper online um watch the news hln the local news sometimes we have to pull away from the news we want to be informed and i believe we should be informed and know what's going on but it adds to the trauma that adds to our uh, that adds to our I don't want to say inability, but kind of prolongs our grief. There's no time frame. Someone says I'm sad because of a loss of pets. They're part of our families. Yes, we grieve the loss of our pets. I forgot to put that up there. Um, opportunities. I work with uh, folks that um, adults, they were seniors. They only had one child, maybe two children. Their children died um, in their 20s. Loss of future um the, the lady said I, I i don't won't know what it's like to be a grandmother you know i said well not from that way but we can redefine who's in our family we can expand our families outside of our you know those we've given birth to i have not given birth to any children but i have three sons and 17 grandchildren and people say how did that happen you know uh I'll read my book and I'll tell you how it happened. But in terms of grief, and I know my time is moving on, even those of us that are working with families, and I think about Dr. Dyer and Ms. Bridgeford and all those in the ministry and other practitioners and clinicians and those in the uh, medical field, seeing death and despair every day, 
um, it impacts us. I am wearing this dog here because of my first cousin who just dropped dead on September 3rd, and she made jewelry. And this is to remind me that, you know, her presence in my life, I'm going to grieve her differently. But while I'm going through my own loss, dealing with my own loss, still have to do what I need to do in terms of helping others. So I say all that. I said a lot, and I said it fast because of, of the time. I'm going to put it all in a PowerPoint as well as some other um, information and some resources. What I say regarding grief, we all are entitled to our feelings and our emotions. Everyone's emotions are valid. Um, it is not just rude and inappropriate, but it is, uh, there was another word I was, it just should be a no-no for someone to speak on someone else's grief. Everyone experiences it differently. Everyone feels lost differently. And so, um, you know, grief is permissible. I think I did say it already. Uh, I read that, that the entire world is grieving together. And as such, I think we've seen more empathy because of the losses and and um, I think about when COVID first hit and the center, uh, one of the center points, um, not just in Italy, but here in the United States was New York and how I was feeling for people I didn't know. I know I wasn't the only one when I read about, you know, the number of deaths and things that were happening and children not able to go to school and things being closed down before we were shut down here. The level of empathy, I think, increased. I hope that that level of empathy doesn't go down because we are all, we are all in this boat together. We're in this world together. And if I'm concerned about you and you're concerned about me, even if it's just a kind word, you know, uh, someone said in one of the other sessions about, well, how do you help someone when you're not a professional and they keep pulling on you? And that's what they do. You can show empathy, love, and concern, but the best thing you can do is help them. Take them by the hand and get them to the professional to deal with the grief. It is a process. It can take years. Um, I lost my mother in 20, 2013, so it's been seven years. And even though I've worked through a lot of it, I will never get over that loss. I don't I don't use that word get over. You know, there are some days I wake up just laughing thinking about her. Some days I wake up crying thinking about her, but it's still a good thing. So I say uh, for those of you out there dealing with grief, whatever it is, your grief, your emotions, your feelings, your needs so are valid. Just laughing Let thinking about her. Some days I wake up crying thinking about her. Thank you very much, so Miss Stephanie. Say, Ms. White, okay. sorry for sharing. Thank you so much. Ms. Bridgeford, would you like to go next? Yes, hi everybody. Um, so a few things I wanna to touch on, um, and I'm gonna be pulling from my own experience, having a lot of grief in my own life. Um, and so at the end of everything I'm gonna say, hopefully I'll be able to just offer some just strategies and things you can do to help navigate not only your own grief, but other people's around you. Um, so I'm going to be pulling from my own experiences with personal grief, but also um, in the work we do with Baltimore Ceasefire and at the Mediation Center, off just constantly engaging with people who are impacted by violence and murder um, and um you know, and being present with those people. So um, I won't repeat things that Stephanie said about the kinds of things that people grieve. I want to add a few things that I think we often just don't think about and we don't even realize um, cause grief. Um, so losing people to incarceration is a huge trauma. And so if you've been living with somebody, if you love somebody, and they get locked up, especially for a long period of time, but even like getting that phone call, and I, I'm still trying to figure out words to describe this without being disrespectful to people who lose people to murder, but because I've lost people to both, I'm trying to find language to really help people understand how similar the phone calls are. So when a homicide detective shows up at your door or when somebody calls you to tell you that somebody you love died, that phone call, that notification, it is a cousin of the kind of pain you get when you get the phone call that somebody you love is in jail. 
um, because they, it feels like they got snatched all of a sudden. There's this sense of helplessness that you have because you can't just get to them. You can't talk to them readily. Um, um, when in studies about trauma in youth, this is one of the major things that causes that makes children more likely as they grow to be violent or to be or to do risky behaviors and things like that. It is one of the adverse traumas in their childhood. Somebody being incarcerated that you love is actually considered a trauma. And so you really do grieve hoping for that person and you know you're worried about what might happen to them while they're in prison and you know and 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 being able to talk to them and not being able to have the same kind of conversations with them because even if they call you from from jail you know it's jail and there's a line of people behind them waiting to use the phone and they can't be open and vulnerable and often really pour out their heart about what they're going through and how they feel and all of that kind of stuff and so you can feel the con the constraints on your communication suddenly with this person and so it's a huge loss in people's lives breakups are things that we grieve and i don't think we think about it that way a lot of times um but when we have breakups, when we get divorced, or if there's been somebody we were in a, a romantic relationship with for a while, and we had hopes and dreams about what this relationship was going to be and what we're co-creating together, and then suddenly the relationship is over, you th there needs to be a grieving period about grieving your hopes and dreams and what you thought was going to happen that's now not going to happen and who you were, you know, things you were planning to do in your life together. Um, and just even grieving like, well, what am I going to do now that I'm not with this person? And, you know, even thinking about dating again and all of that kind of stuff, like we have to allow ourselves that grief process because there was a death of something really important in your life and you feel torn on the inside because, you know, you got, you feel torn away from something that was a part of you. Um, I have experienced, um, because there's so much murder. So I've been seeing, I'm, I'm turning 48 next month and I have been losing people to violence since I was 12 years old. And I noticed in my late twenties and early thirties, I had this really bad bout with depression and it had to do with me two things. So there's survivor's guilt and survivor's remorse or whatever, you know, pick a word, guilt or remorse. But there's this thing you go through when you come from an environment where as you grow up, either a lot of people you grew up with are being killed, they're being incarcerated, or they're being lost to drug addiction. And so even when you do run into them on the street, you don't hardly recognize who they are because how their how addiction is ravaging their actual body. Um, and so when I was in my early 30s, I started feeling like I was looking around and I was like one of the only ones left you know, that, that I grew up with, or in, in, in even of those of us who are left, looking around and realizing how many of us are actually healthy and happy and walking in our purpose and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so I started feeling really lonely and sad and guilty. Like, why am I still here? Why am I making it? I came out of the same circumstances that all of these other people did. Who am I that I get to still be halfway okay, you know? Um, and I went as to, in talking to people about it, my therapist actually pointed out that a lot of it had to do with because I lost so many people I was experiencing something you're not supposed to feel until you're a senior citizen until you're an elder right so elders experience that they look around and they're one of the only ones left because so many people have that you know that's a guarantee if you turn 90 you're gonna look around it's not a whole bunch of your people still around you might be the last person left in your family you know, like my grandma is the last, her parents,
parents are dead and all her siblings are dead. So she's literally not just the matriarch of our entire family, but there's nobody else in her nuclear family that's still here. And 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 she's 90 years old, right? And but in my late in my early 30s, I started feeling that way. Right. And I think that's something that we don't often pay attention to or, or really notice. Um and then also when you experience certain kinds of trauma, you grieve the you that you were used to being. So for example, I've been raped twice in my life. And um, after the, the both by men that I knew and trusted um, and both times in my own home. And so um, after the first time, I went through a grief and a loneliness because I was afraid to tell anybody that I had been raped, right? And I was a grown up, but I was embarrassed and I I was afraid that people would say it was my fault and all kinds of stuff. And so for years, I didn't say it out loud. I really believed that if I said the words out of my mouth that I was just gonna fall to the floor and maybe not ever get back up. Like that, just saying those three words, I was raped. I just, I couldn't imagine saying it. And so instead I hid it for years. And even by the time I said it out loud, unearthing all of that guilt and shame and pain and should I have fought him harder and should I have, you know, like all of that stuff, the me that I thought I was, has somebody ever told me that I would be in that situation before that day? I would have been like, oh no, cause I would, you know, I wish somebody would, I would bust him aside his head, you know what I mean? But at the time that it was happening, I kept looking over from my bed. There was a lamp right on the, on the, um, nightstand and I kept debating in my head do I pick up this lamp and bust him over his head with it and all of the things that played out in my mind about what might happen if I do that he could kill me I lived upstairs my grandmom has a duplex and at the time I lived upstairs with my two-year-old child and so uh, (laughs) you know I played out like if I hit him and I can't get away Or even if I do, what is he going to do to me and my child and my grandma? I'm like, right now, only me and him know that this is happening right now. But if I escalate things into attacking him back, my whole house can be in an upheaval. And then, you know, like all of those kind of things I struggled with. And so the me that I thought I was, I had to grieve and accept that. And then the second time I was raped, I literally forgot that it happened. And what I mean is years later, so I stopped speaking to the guy and then years later, Facebook became a thing and he inboxed me on Facebook. And when I first saw the message, I was like, I knew I didn't like him for some reason, but I couldn't like remember what it was. And then I kept thinking, okay, well, if I can't remember why I'm mad at him, maybe it wasn't anything that bad. So I was just chit chat with him. Right. And so that's what I did. I was like, Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. We chit chatted. And I mentioned it to one of my girlfriends and she was like, what are you doing? We don't like him. We don't talk to him. And I was like, what you mean? We don't talk to him. She was like, we don't like people who put their penis in you without your permission and held you down. And I was like, Oh my God. Like I could not believe that it was gone out of my memory. And so then my it felt like my own mind had failed. And so grieving, again, like uh, something that I, I, I take a lot of pride in the brilliance of my mind. And so to be in a space where my mind wasn't holding what I felt like was really important information was really traumatic and, and, and took some grief. There's this thing that people talk about where like the question, like does time heal all wounds? So my thoughts around that are, especially when it comes to death, I think it's actually merciful that it takes your entire life to actually grieve someone that you lost, who you really loved. And the reason I say that is because when you think about your grief process, you can have good days. You, you know, time will go by, it'll be 10 years later, and people are looking at you like, oh, well, you shouldn't be as hurt as bad. But sometimes, 
like when my brother was dead for 10 years, he'd been killed in 2007. So in 2017, when I started the ceasefire, I grieved like he was just, like he had just been killed. Because to me, time proved that he really wasn't coming back. You know, like the part of you that's like, well, maybe, you know, the longer time goes, you had like the, the acceptance of like, oh, wow, I'm really not going to hug him, hear his voice, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. So sometimes time actually makes it worse. Um, and so my mom has what my mom said. Oh, so this thing about it taking your whole life to grieve. I think that's merciful that, um, you know, it ebbs and flows. You can have good days and then the wind might blow a certain way a day and it just, you fall to pieces or a song comes on or there's a smell in the air, you know, or something and you just suddenly, you just fall to pieces and you may have been fine for months, you know, but I think that happens over your lifetime because if in the beginning of your grief, when the person first dies, if you felt all of everything you were going to go through for the rest of your life about this right now in the beginning, we would not be able to survive it. You wouldn't be able to handle all of the pain that you're going to go through the rest of your life about this thing. It's like it, it gets allowed to be stretched out over time, you know, so that it's not just a constant thing on you even when even if you think about the person every day sometimes you think about them with joy and laughter you know and so over time you learn those things and and for me I learned to have a new relationship with the person because they're not in a body that I can recognize anymore but I believe that our spirits are eternal and so their essence is still a real thing I just now have to learn how to recognize them now that they're not in the body that I'm that I'm used to seeing. Um, my mom describes it because, you know, she's a mother who lost her child to violence. She describes it as, it's not necessarily that time has healed that wound for her, but she's now accepted that you just live with a wound for the rest of your life. And so when you think about what happens with wounds, they scab over sometimes, right? But then over time, something might happen that just rips the scab off suddenly, right? And so the pain is fresh. Um, or even if it leaves a scar, right? Sometimes things happen that irritate that part of your body and remind you of the, you know, so she says that you live with a wound for the rest of, of your life. Um, and so that means you have to take care of that wound. You know, you have to do the work of taking care of yourself when things about the wound arise. Um, and people really do grieve in their own way. And so there's not like a science to how you should grieve and how you shouldn't and how often you should talk about it. And how, there's not a science to it because each, each person is finding out as they are in it what their grief process is going to look and feel like. Thinking about COVID-19, the impacts that it's having around grief and loss specifically, um, that the fact that we can't do funerals and repasts the way that we are used to, you know, the, the gathering and the coming together and the memorializing people um, is very different. And that's, ex that's extremely hard. We've seen an increase. So because there's so much trauma already there are already epidemics that are you know already in motion and then here comes this pandemic and so what we see is there's an increase in domestic violence there's an increase in women women being murdered in their relationships because people have been forced to be in close proximity staying in the house with each other more and so conflicts and all kinds of stuff right have escalated and so not just an increase in domestic violence and the murder of women but an increase in youth suicide attempts as well an increase in parents putting their children out of the house an increase in young people running away from home Right. And so because there's been already the 
the trauma and the epidemics that those families were already dealing with. This one more thing for a lot of people is making people react in ways that you would think, well, why would you put your child out at a time like this? Right. But some for some people, like having to stay in together is kind of their their final straw and they don't know really what else to do. Um, So just a few of my thoughts about things we can do. Um, So when you are trying to help somebody else who is experiencing grief, watch your mouth. (laughs) People say the stupidest stuff. When you lose somebody, Hmm. like, it's okay. Shutting up is always a viable option. Like, it really is. Just saying, I'm here for you. Whatever you need. But I find that, so people would say things to my mother, and I, I, as I work with, with, with parents who lose people, lose their children to violence, this is a thing that people will say to them if they had more than one child and they lost one child. They'll say, oh, well, you still got other kids. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Like, you know, and my mom would say, but I don't, my brother's name was Corny. You know, I don't have any more of him, though. Like, there's no extra ones of him laying around. Yes, I have other children, but none of them are him. And so, and that's the loss that that I'm grieving. So it's really, it doesn't matter that you have other children. And then people sometimes also do like, um, I I call it like a grief and trauma competition with you sometimes. And so, for example, I posted about how my son, my 21-year-old son in 2019, was surrounded by four police officers out of the blue with guns drawn in his face while he was in the car. Traumatized my family in ways I still can't verbal. I didn't talk about it until this year when um, Ahmaud Arbery was killed by police officers. That triggered me to tell my my story about my son. And somebody came and said, well, at least your son is still alive. Mine got killed in the streets. And people only care when the police kill somebody. And I'm like, first of all, do you know who I am? Like, I came out, I show up at every murder spot in the city. I'm not the person to even say this to. But still, don't start a comment to somebody with at least you still have like i'm i'm grieving what i lost i'm grieving what happened to us i'm dealing with the trauma of what i'm actually going through there's no there's enough pain to go around for everybody we don't have to compete with one another about well at least yours is easier than mine because you don't know what that means for me to know that my son was surrounded by four police officers and the you know, getting that phone call from him at 12.30 at night when we had been, he was missing. In our mind, my child was missing all day. You know, and I kept saying, it's, this is not just his phone is dead. I could feel it in the depths of my bones that something was not right with my son. And so when my phone rang at 12.30 and he called from a jail, from the jail, I was relieved and shattered all at the same time. Mm-hmm. You know, and so, and I have a right to that, and it shouldn't be compared to somebody else's pain that they think is worse. Um, Don't say things to people like it'll get better (laughs) when they're first dealing with a loss. Shut up! I can't imagine how it's gonna get better. Like, even think about when you first break up with somebody, and somebody come along like, oh, you'll love again. Shut up! It's not time to think about that I'm going to love again. and Like, I shouldn't be thinking about that right now. I got to get through this loss first before I start thinking about how much love I'm going to get again. This is not the time for that. And so especially when somebody dies, I know we often don't know what to say, but telling people, you know, it's going to get better, that already sets people up for failure because what if it, they don't feel better about it a year from now? What if two years from now they're still depressed about it? You know what I mean? And when people keep telling them it's going to get better, then it makes them think there's something wrong with them because it's not getting better for them, right? And so um, instead you can say things like, you know, so I learned not to, not to say to people, Um, What do you need? What can I help you with? Because often when you're in the midst of that kind of trauma, you have no clue what you need. You can't even think about what you could possibly need. So instead of asking people, well, let me know if you need anything, 
I'm grieving. I'm not going to call you and say nothing. I'm going in the cocoon and I'm not coming out. Right. And so instead of saying, let putting the onus on the grieving person to let you know when they need to reach out to you, let them know, you know what? I'm going to be checking on you. I'm just going to be checking in to see what you need. Right. And then follow through with it. Like really do it and do it after the funeral is over. After people stop bringing chicken and macaroni and cheese and everything and nobody else is showing up because the burial has happened and everybody went back to their life. You can be that person that still checks in and says, hey, I'm just checking in on you. You need anything? What can I do? You need to talk, you know, like just check in with people, really. Um, Also, um, I find rituals really helpful. So we do sacred space rituals where we literally, every time somebody is killed in the city, the Baltimore Ceasefire 365 movement, we show up at every murder location. And we put our bodies in the spot where this person's body fell so that their body is not alone in that experience. And so that we're putting our life and love filled bodies in that space um, where their bodies fell to honor that their life mattered and that it matters to us that we lost somebody um, to violence. And so just the ritual of showing up like that constantly and consistently, not only has it been a blessing and a miracle in my personal journey just because of the things that happened, but we're now seeing that Baltimore, so we burn sage and frankincense, right, when we're, because we're cleansing the space. Um, And so now it is this thing where when people see smoke, they just start going, oh, it's the ceasefire people. Like, they know it. And so it's a seeing smoke is a trigger for people to know that healing is happening in their neighborhood, that love has shown up in their neighborhood. And people literally, like, pull their cars over and get out and be like, oh, yeah, I'm stopping traffic for a minute, but can you can you put some sage smoke around me, right? So we just tell people, yeah, come on and get the smoke, you know? So having some kind of ritual thing that you're able to do when there's a consistent kind of loss that's happening like find something that you can consistently do so for us the mindset is with murder is a very prevalent arrogant energy so we have to be just as persistent as that energy we got to show up just as much as it does and so we're going toe to toe with murder so that it doesn't have the last say in that space the last say was life and love and life got left right there and that actually means a lot and so the last thing i want to say is that whatever it is you're trying to do or help somebody with you got to be doing your own healing work because you cannot give what you don't have. I know sometimes people join groups, support groups, and they end up finding them to be toxic spaces because some of the people in the group are not actually doing their own healing. And so, you know, like it's it's just not helpful sometimes. And so if you want to be of support or whatever for other people, you got to be facing your own stuff. You got to be honest with yourself. You got to deep dive into the bowels of your pain and the crevices of your mind and all of that kind of stuff to really be unearthing and doing your own healing work. A, so that you can be present with other people, but B, because that's not the last thing you're going to experience, right? Like So like Stephanie was saying, as soon as you get over one thing, there's another thing and then another thing. And so it becomes majorly important that we are doing our healing work so that when that next thing comes, we are jumping off of a bridge somewhere. That's all I got. Thank you so much, Ms. Bridgeport, for sharing your experiences and just giving us advice and love at the same time. Um, so now we're going to, um, so if there are people that are listening on Facebook Live, could you please post any questions you have in the comment section and we will get to them? Um, so the Q&A session um, is for all three of our panelists. And that's the first question I have about a child, a teen, is grieving Um, and dealing with some type of loss. So what are some signs? um, I'll take that one. 
Mr. So, Miss White, um, you're on mute. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you yes, hear me? Okay. They, yes. uh, they didn't say a specific age, but as I heard, I heard some of the question. What are some of the signs that a child is right. grieving? Is that was that the question? A child, an adult, a child, adult, or a teen. So are oh, there okay. general signs that? Okay. Okay. All right. So anyone, if if, if a person, one of a person is grieving, uh, well, first of all, the changes in their behavior, the presentation. First of all, um, they may not say that they feel a certain way, but if they have enough cognition, uh, old enough, they may say, I feel sad. Or a young child might say, my tummy hurts, you know, or they may say one sentence statement um, about a friend, or they may uh, transpose it over to an animal, if a young child, a stuffed animal, one of their toys. Uh, they may not say anything, but you notice change in behavior. Eating, mm -hmm. overeating, not wanting to eat, sleeping too much, not able to sleep, rambling around at night uh, for a teenager, engaging in risky behavior, something they wouldn't have even thought of before, uh, uh, feeling extremely sad over what they're going through. Uh, we, we really, I, I recommend, I mean, be careful with my statements, that we be in touch with what's going on with our youth because, you know, we don't know everything about them. And, and think about when we were teenagers, we were very good at hiding from our parents what we were doing, some of our activities, because we were all little angels, right? But anyway, uh, recognizing, you know, whereas some of the things that they did every day uh, or activities, they're no longer taking pleasure. Same way with an adult, going through the motions, going to work, you know, uh, but doing the bare, uh, minimum, taking care of the family, but not able to engage, not able to have a, a conversation. And look at the obvious, crying, um, excessive crying, or a flat affect. A flat affect is where face is just what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Flat, no emotion is shown. So, uh, you know, those are some of the signs uh, with our mature persons stating, why am I still here? I, 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 I wish I, um, you know, my dad has said oftentimes about going with my mother, you know, and I try to process what's going on with him. Is he feeling sadness, you know, or is it just a conversation? Uh, you know, don't pick it apart. But you ask the question. It's okay to ask someone, how are you feeling? You know, um, and like I said, some signs are obvious and some are not. But let the person know that you are there to listen to them. Hope that, hope that Would anyone else like to expound on that question? Yeah, one one of the things that um, uh, Miss Stephanie also talked about is is recognizing your child, and in in that recognition of the child, you can also get a sense of feeling. Allow yourself to feel the child. Allow yourself to. Um, be in tune with not what the child can say or hasn't said or would say, but just your heart feeling. You know, parents, whether they, if they've been remiss or disconnected from the child for whatever reason, they actually have what you call a genetic code that speaks to the child. So you can feel your child's pain and suffering. You may not know how to discern it from yourself, and that may be a little bit confusing, but you can definitely feel when a child is disconnected from their selves. And the one way to really tell that child is hug it. Because when you hug your child, no matter how old or whatever, when you hug your child, you get a sense of what you call a vibration from your child. That child will give you a signal in their body whether something is wrong. And that's if a child is unable to speak. If a child's unable to speak because they're too young, there are things happening in the vibration of your hug. That's why we have healing hugs. That's why we have transmission of hugs. That's why we love, we embrace. Embrace and in that embrace, there's a lot of information. Thank 
to be sharing. So another um, question that we had, I guess, would you give to a person that may have suicidal thoughts due to the loss of something or someone? Well, you know, Erica had said in this very succinctly, and I just want to say, you're just a beautiful, amazing woman that we have in our world, and we need to embrace a, a, a lot of them and all the people who are taking care of each other. But listening and being there and being quiet, you know, sometimes just shut up and be there because the thing about suicide is that if you say the wrong thing, and you probably will if you're not a professional, you're going to allow, they're going to commit suicide off of what you said, even though you meant for it to be caring. And it's going to come out sideways. I'm just telling you. But what you can do is you can be there and you can make the call to the 911. You can make the call to the hotline. You can make the call to the police officer and say, I'm going to be here with you but I am going to be quiet. And that's all you have to say is that we're going to be here together. So that's enough. And then get and get them the help that they're going to need because saving a life is, is, is very important. Um, I, I would like to add to that. So um, I tried to kill myself on December 4th of 2004. And I spent seven days on the psych ward. Um, and then... And I don't know what somebody could have said to me because I wasn't saying anything that it was a shock to everybody. Like, you know, I was scheduled to show, I was, a, there was a group of mediators waiting for me to come and give them a five hour training that day. And I just didn't show up at the training and, and people were like, you know, there were no indications from anybody, um, that, <laughs> that I would do anything like that. So sometimes you don't necessarily know that that's where somebody's mind might go. Um, and I didn't know it until that day in that moment that I was just done, you know? Um, but what I will say is, um, my children, specifically my youngest child, she's turning 21, um, in November. Um, her and I often talk about how her and I both feel a little hardwired to leave here. You know, there are some of us who we kind of feel like an alien in this realm. And there are constant things that happen in our society, I think, mostly, that we being um, as empathetic or, you know, spiritually sensitive or whatever, we're constantly absorbing so much stuff. Um, and so I learned when I went through the Roper Academy um, around trauma, I learned that trauma is not stored in the same part of our brain where we have language. And so often talk therapy and talking it out might not be as good as doing other kinds of things to actually target where trauma is stored. So trauma is stored in our body memory. Trauma is stored in our, you know, smelling sensory. Trauma is stored, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And so it's often more helpful when people have, like, music therapy and art therapy and stuff like that. And so, like, asking a child, well, what color do you feel? If, you, if you're feel, how you feel right now was a color, what would that be? Or, you know, draw a picture of how you're feeling in your family right now. And so, like, you notice they draw everybody else really big and they make themselves really small. Or they draw a picture of outside and the clouds are black instead of blue. Or, you know, like, whatever. Um, or, or, you know, engaging people with art and music um, can be really helpful as well. And so what I do when I notice that my child is depressed, so in 2019, she was crying in the shower, and then she went in her room, and I just walked in there, and I just flat out asked, like, I, because I had been in that moment of not wanting to be here, I recognized the sound in her cry, the mm -hmm. tone of voice mm -hmm. of her cry sounded like, if I leave this house, she was supposed to be getting ready for work, but the way she was crying, I knew that if I left the house thinking she's just going to get herself together and go to work, 
I was going to come home and find my child dead later today. And so I stopped everything. And I, and this is where our experiences can serve us, right? Mm-hmm. Because maybe had I not had my own suicide attempt, I wouldn't have noticed the tone of voice in her cry. And so I just walked right into her room and I said, do you still want to be alive or not? And her response was, I'm afraid to answer the question. And I said, okay, say no more. And I got, I dressed her and took her to the hospital. <laughs> and she, you know, it just got her all the help and whatever she need, needed. And I treated it like triage. When she came home, you know, like, like intensive care unit. When she came home, our house was an intensive care unit. And I invited all my women friends to come around her. And, uh, you know, like and people just pour into her. And, and, and different times when she's struggling and going through things, um, I we do that. So yesterday she was having a hard time. I called her godmother to come over here. And her godmother brought art. And they, you know, were doing art together. So um, really learning about how trauma impacts people so that when somebody you love is at the brink of making a decision about whether or not to take their life, you might actually have some helpful things to offer. But always don't be afraid to just take people to the hospital. Thank you so much for sharing. Stephanie, you're muted. I think you're trying to say she is still on mute. Am I unmuted? There you go. Am I unmuted? Am I still muted? Yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. Okay. We just want to add to that what what Dr. Dyer and Sister Erica said is true. One of the things, having worked in inpatient psychiatry, that uh, what I learned and I saw and experienced is, first of all, if there are signs and if the person um, expresses, you know, feelings of suicide, you take them seriously. I don't care even if they say it in a joking way. You always take it seriously. Do not go into any judgment. And as Sister Erica say, I was one of those ones that said, and I want to take you by the hand and we're going to the hospital. You know, uh, uh, in, in social work school, University of Maryland, they went through all that with us. You know, you ask them, do you have a plan? And, 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 and you know, what is your plan? And it's like a list of questions. And I, I've done that also. But there have been times when you can get, uh, I think what uh, Dr. Thayer was saying, you can sense it. Uh, Sister Erica said she felt it from her daughter. You don't have time for all of that. You want to show them caring, concern, um, like I said, no judgment right then, and we're going to the hospital together. And then afterward, I love that her house became uh, the mm-hmm. hospital. Let her homes be safe and nurturing and therapeutic as well. Get whatever services you need and treatment in there. And uh, I made a note somewhere um, <laughs> to, 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 to remove the shame and the stigma. You know, a lot of that uh, has contributed, those feelings of shame and stigma have contributed to someone try, uh, trying to again and uh, trying the attempt, suicide attempt again. One of the things that I also would lastly like to say is having been uh, as a Christian and being raised in the church, and I know a lot of things have changed in these 60 almost plus plus years that I've been on earth uh there was once upon a time i know in in my in my denomination where people were made to feel bad if they um didn't just pray about it and pray it away and i don't think we hear a lot of that now but there may be still some dogmatic folks and we as people of faith no matter what your belief is your faith system is i like what sister erica say we need to show them the love we believe in the creator we need to show them the love to say whatever it is i don't have the answer but i want to take your hand you know and walk with you um in this so i just wanted to add that Mm -hmm. thank you very much um i just quickly wanted to mention um the national suicide prevention hotline it is 1-800- Two seven three eight two five five. Again, one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. And for anyone.
who is going through grief and loss to the point where you are feeling suicidal. We just want to let you know that you are not alone. You have people mm -hmm. that are there for you. You have people um, that can, you can call this number, people that will speak to you and, and will talk you through things and will just, if, even if you need them to sit on the phone and just kind of just in silence to have that presence of the person there with you, they will do that for you as well. Um, so before we kind of wrap things up, I do want to ask a question about what are some other resources for families, um, for adults, for children, uh, dealing with grief and loss. So if you know any tangible resources that people can go and look up or visit, could you provide that to us, please? Yeah. Um, am I, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. we can hear you. Yes, we okay. can hear you. So I will absolutely put this in my PowerPoint, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Dyer and Sister Erica may have the same, but many of us are already familiar with Roberta's House, of course, mm -hmm. and the great work that they do. We hear about it with children, but they do work with all ages. Mm -hmm. The Loyola Clinical Centers up at uh, Loyola college in maryland i think they've been new name since i was there but they do have at their clinics they have uh they offer services and specifically grief groups compassionate friends is an excellent organization uh pr their primary um response is to women who had suffered loss of a child um i'm sorry not just women parents who suffered the loss of a child through death they even go to, to miscarriage um, the child could be an adult child. They are excellent. They are in the Maryland area. NAMI with the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill mm -hmm. is another uh, organization that is in our area. Um, the organization that I'm uh, proud to work with, AGS Programs, which stands for Achieving Your Greater Self, Your Greatest Self. Uh, we have psycho psychologists, psychiatrists medication management, uh, group work, uh, grief groups, mm. uh, uh, all type of individual services, um, PRP, psychiatric rehab services, they are excellent. Pastoral Counseling Services of Maryland is another, and I will add some others to the list. And of course, we know that the Well Foundation is there as well. Yeah. Mm. I, I tell folks, <clears throat> some people say, I don't know where to start. First of all, we have to take care of our health. Mm -hmm. So everyone should have a primary provider, your homeopathic uh, doctors, whatever. So start with your uh, your your carer, your provider, your health provider with them and let them know that how you're feeling. Uh, maybe get some referrals from them as well. Everybody feels differently about medication. And my, you know, I think it's diet, you know, with a look at diet maybe in conjunction with medication, in conjunction with therapy, in conjunction with support, because there are many support groups out there, and then your own personal team of support. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have to say about that. Thank you very much. And we will also, in addition to Miss um, Whitehurst's PowerPoint, we'll also put everything on the Well Foundation Facebook page. Um, so do any of our presenters have any final comments? I just want to add. Like to share? I just want to add one thing, and it's about what Erica had said. Sister Erica has said um, about the frankincense and sage. Some people had one wonder why that works, and I just want to add some enlightenment on that. <clears throat> being um, studying shamanism for many years, is that the sage attaches to the negative energy of the earth, right? And it pulls it down. The, it, it, the, the sage actually attaches to the negative energy and it pulls it down to the earth so it can grow into a plant. And so it has a rebirth to it. That's what sage does. The frankincense allows, the frankincense has a connection to the spiritual world. Meaning that it, it allows the soul to release into the universe. 
So other spirits and souls allowed to embrace what the frankincense is doing. That's why they've been doing it for thousands of years and using frankincense and sir and, and sage. And then when you add myrrh, if you ever want to add myrrh, it allows for the loving embrace of the universe. So when you, that's why so many um, religious um, settlements have used frankincense and myrrh, and that was the calling of our ancestral gods from the past. Past, present, and future. So I love that. Can you say that last thing about Omar one more time? You all made my whole head pop off right now. <laughs> so I want to just thank you very much for articulating this so clearly. <laughs> what did you say, Mur? Uh, like it embraces. What did you say? I'm sorry. It embraces our ancestral past from the um, past, present, and future. So that's what it does. So that's what Myrrh does. It it connects to it connects the lineage of it. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it embraces yeah, yeah. the ancestral oh my goodness. So we can talk for like another hour just about this, but I'm gonna just I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> Erica, you got my number. We're going to... Hey. Would anyone else like to share? Would anyone else like to share? Any final comments? Um, yeah, I would. I would like to offer a final comment. Um, 